let's talk about the games from Sunday. The end to week one. Five games on. Upsets, blowouts, big performances, terrible performances, but it's always solid and steady from Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy, your daily NBA fantasy podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd. Excuse me, I might just break out and start emoting at any point. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble, on TikTok at RedRock underscore Beeble, and on Instagram at LockedOnFantasyBasketball. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Start the season with a big return on FanDuel. New customers can place a $5 bet and get started with $150 in bonus bets if that first $5 bet wins. Go to FanDuel.com to get started. I've also got a newsletter for your favorite team. So go to LockedOnDaily.com, check out your favorite team, subscribe, and get all of the news about your team delivered straight into your inbox. You can inbox a thumb to me by just dropping it here on the video. You can double bang and listen to the audio and watch the video and leave all of your comments below, which is always what I want to see. So we're recapping Sunday. This is the end of week one in the NBA. So let's just take a look at the things that have happened. Let's catch you up on um, news that went down. It's always, it's always a good way to go. Let's start off. Only a couple of real interesting things here. and I actually should have just put this in because it just happened. Ja Morant has, is now questionable for Memphis. So that, to me, indicates very highly he is going to be on a minutes limit if he plays. So yeah, we are really, really looking at Scottie Pippen. Until he goes back to 18 minutes... Um, or even less, if Pippen gets 24, he, he's a guy we roster. I don't see how it lasts long-term, as I detailed on the show earlier today, but that's okay. Josh Hart is also questionable, and so is Bradley Beal after he missed the last game. Grayson Allen will return for Phoenix. Josh Hart being questionable, like if Josh Hart misses, he's got an ankle impeachment. If he misses, they got no one. I don't know what they're going to do, because well, they probably will start, I guess they would start Jericho Sims, I guess, and move Towns to the four. There's, they've got no forwards, like, at all. I guess, maybe they could start campaign. Oh, no, they'd start Juice McBride. they start McBride, Brunson, Bridges, and Anobi. That's a lot of Bs in that group. And then, like, man, that would be incredibly shallow if Josh Hart happens to miss. And that might open up streaming opportunities. Remember, they've got 11 games on Monday. So it's not a super, super great opportunity. But they could be yeah, in absolutely gigantic strife if Josh Hart misses. And that is the... The perils, which correlates across the fantasy, of stars and scrubs. It's all well and good if you've got a great top six, top seven. But when they get hurt, yeah, not very good, is it? And they got the Cavs tomorrow as well, so that will be a um, very interesting one to watch. Let's take a look at the way that things have trended across the fantasy basketball waiver wire landscape over the last 24 hours. The most added player is just a gigantic L. I had DeAndre Hunter in terms of streaming for today, is a really good option. Of course, he didn't play. Knee soreness. And Hunter's been this way all the time. A lot of knee problems. Massive inconsistency. He is not like a must-hold, must-roster guy. Like, he played well. He had a game today. We thought, all right, let's see it. Didn't happen. Move on. Jordy Hawkins was one of the most added players. And while these guys are out, Hawkins is going to provide really good points and really good threes, and that's exactly what happened today. Now, the Pelicans are really struggling, obviously. But Hawkins is, is you know, the large role. We actually saw him do this at the start of his rookie season when two to three players are out. He's better than he, he was then. But it is also still hard that, like, when DeJounte is back, which is a long way away, but when Trey is back, he will have to push down the pecking order somewhat. It, it will just happen. Torian Prince was added to be a streamer today, and, of course, he, um, he Torian Prince himself. Kyle Lowry was one of the most added players. And of course, he, Kyle Lowry himself, it was a terrible day for streaming. Benedict Matherin was one of the most added players, I'm guessing, to stream in for today. And guess what he did? Yeah, he was terrible as well. All those guys were horrendous in terms of the ads, apart from Jordan Hawkins. Scott Pippen, though, one of the most added players. We just talked about him with Ja Morant. He's been awesome. He is a really good player. I don't see how he plays 24 minutes a night if Moran is playing 33 minutes. And I don't see how Ja and Pippen play together at the expense of Marcus Smart, and then there's Vince Williams still to return. I don't think that all happens, but Pippen has been great. He's going to be an every-night rotation piece. 
at the very minimum. And for now, look, we, we roll with it. We see where it ends up and we see how they do things. I don't think anyone expected the Grizzlies to be running a 12-man rotation with Morant playing 24 minutes a night. I don't think you could have. That would have been honestly insane. Imagine I had to come out here and said, all right, guys, I think the Grizzlies are going to play John Morant 24 minutes and do an even split with Scottie Pippen. It's, in, it's literally insane to have thought that was going to be the case. But here we are, and that is what is happening. Who are the most dropped players? Well, one of them is Marcus Smart, and I actually got no problem with it. I don't mind a hold on to Marcus Smart, but he's played like 20 and 21 minutes the last two games. So yeah, look, that's not trending in the right direction. So he's also not very good. People drop Santi Aldama, and we, we know why, because he has been very up and down. Although, like last game, he was better. But he's all over the shop. Great game, bad game, good game. His value will drop significantly, obviously, when Jaron pushes back to big minutes, but who knows when that will happen. The whole team, the, the rotation is a disaster. Like, what, what do we do with Jay Huff, who in deeper leagues is a great ad, but he's a two-way contract player, and he should be on a full contract. He's good. He's better than Zach Eady. He's better than Brandon Clark. I like Jay Huff, but he is 27. But there's just so much confusion on that team. Karis Levert was dropped, much like Marcus Smart. He's playing 20 minutes a night. Real test for Levert tomorrow against the Knicks to see how much he plays. But if he's in the 22 zone, like we move on without any question. Kevin Porter Jr., that's an easy jacking to me. Get that garbage out of here. Grayson Allen's an easy jack. Get that garbage out of here. Even though he is returning tomorrow. And if Beal is out, that might move Allen up. But I don't see the long-term value there. And then Contavious Caldwell Pope, one of the more drop players. Again, rightfully so. He is not a must-hold or must-roster player. But the Magic have a really strong period of schedule here. And if you are just looking for that, or even to stream tomorrow, KCP's got value, but he hasn't played 30 minutes in the last two games. He's going to be up and down. There's going to be some defensive stats in there. And we know who he is. There's no upside. So when you're taking a chance, maybe you do believe that Scott Pippen will play big minutes. Maybe. Maybe you believe that, yeah, Christian Brown will be the second coming of Jonathan Isaac. Maybe. These guys like Marcus Smart and Karis LeVert and Contavious Caldwell-Pope, they're guys that can easily be moved on from because the upside of them is, is just really, really low. Like it, it's, well, I think we know that. It's just, it's not high. Which is, of course, what um, low means. <sighs> First game. It was an early one. So we're going back to some regular times to start now. And we got the Philadelphia 76ers. And they uh, took the game against the Pacers to overtime. And they won. Wow. There you go. The Sixers season so far has been confusing and confounding. And they don't play now again until Wednesday. Uh, and we might have Embiid and Paul George back in that one. What we are getting at the moment is just insane playing time from Tyrese Maxey. 48 minutes. Now, it was overtime, but still. He had 45 points, five threes, four assists, two blocks. But he is really hurting on the field goal percentage. Really hurting. Maxey shot 44% from the field on huge volume, and he was, what, 13 of 15 from the line? 12 of 15 from the line. It's frustrating. He will likely see much lower usage, or almost assuredly, down from 37%, but the efficiency should rise. We saw this play out last season. We had a big game from Andre Drummond. The big avocado had 9 and 17 with two steals and a block, while Caleb Martin also put up the big numbers. He was also a priority stream guy from yesterday, so that one at least worked out. 37 minutes, 17 and 12. But all of this is going to be completely like useless for us when these other players return. Kelly Oubre stunk because, you know, what do you think? He was like uh, Kelly Oubre. 14 points. That seems okay, but he took 18 shots. He didn't hit a three. He had no assists. He did get two steals, and he was very inefficient. He's fine for now. Long term, I don't think he will be. And Kyle Lowry started again over Eric Gordon, but he played 17 minutes, and Gordon played 32. So if you'd watched Eric Gordon play the first two games, and you'd watched Kyle Lowry play, you would have said this is impossible for this to happen. But these are the vagaries of coaches' rotations. These are the vagaries of the NBA regular season. This is why when we talk head-to-head -head leagues, there's so much individual variance that you just don't know. It can just be all over the shop in terms of how it plays out. KJ Martin, who started the opening game, which is just so weird. He had eight points in 22 minutes here while Yebisale went scoreless in his 17 and was finally a good game from Eric Gordon. We don't react to it. Of course, we drop Kyle Lowry, but we don't have to hold Gordon, who had 15 points in 32 minutes. And they don't play, as I said, again, until... Um, what day is it? Oh, Wednesday. That's what it was. I just completely blanked on um, on what day that they were playing. On the Indiana side of things, really, really disappointing start to the season for the Pacers, as I'm sure you're well aware. They go down 118-114 was the final score, if I forgot to mention that. Let's talk about Tyrese Halliburton, who again is just so, sort of off, like something is just weird. He played 37 minutes. 
He scored 22 points, including the game-tying three to send to overtime, but that's not what we invested in Halliburton for. He had 22-4-2 with four threes and no steals. He shot 44% and was 2-5 of four, five from the line. There is something, and I don't know what it is, there is something going on here. Because this man, for two consecutive seasons, averaged 20 points and 10 assists. That's hard to do over 120 games or whatever it was. It's very hard to do, but he did it. Now, this season, he gets no assists. The shooting numbers are well down. He's a 39% career three-point shooter. He's not hitting free throws. When asked after the game, he's like, oh, do you feel right? So he's like, no. All right, something is off. I, I don't know. Did he get hypothermia from being in the snow? Who's to say? But something is off. If you drafted him in the round one, don't panic. It will pro- almost definitely get better. And also, you can't do anything with it anyway. What are you going to do? Sell low for a top 50 player? What for? Just be annoyed? Sure. Vent, let it out. But it's going to be better. We've got a track record of this. Siakam played 40 minutes. He had 17, 5, and 6. And he's been like fine. He's been fine. And Miles Turner, the big minutes here for him. 37 of them. Yes, there is overtime, but still. 14 and 4, 4 steals and a block. So he's had big minutes, low minutes, big minutes. And the low minutes was the blowout. That meant that we barely got any Isaiah Jackson, who played just six minutes. He had a block in that time, but he's only going to be valuable, it appears, if Turner is out, because they're giving Turner more minutes than he did last season. Aaron Neesmith had a good game finally, 10-7 and seven with a steal, but he's just only a 14-team league sort of a player. And Ben Matherin, like I touched on earlier, people streamed him in. He had 5-2-2, two and two, didn't hit a 3, shot 33%. And he just is nowhere, nowhere remotely close to a 12-team league guy. Not even, not even sniffing, sniffing the used clothing of a 12-team league person. Get that garbage out of here. He's not even there. Andy Nempard, one of his better games and shot 27%. He had 10 points with 8 assists. He is still also not near a 12-team league player. Although, his assists are incredibly valuable. And I do expect that he shoots better. I just, I just don't know how how solidly we should be considering him as a hold. I'm not I'm not fully there with it. Today's episode is brought to you by Fangel. Get ready to tackle the NFL season with Fangel America's number one sportsbook because right now you're a new customer on Fangel. You can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The Fangel Sportsbook app gives you everything that you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you're watching the game, Something's going down. You got you open up your app and you can see the live bets there. But you also got the stats, the live play-by-play, all in the one spot. No need to fumble around to other positions, other apps, other computers, whatever. It's all there on the old Fanjul app. So join Fanjul.com today and get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. That is Fanjul.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with Fanjul, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. And don't forget to gamble responsibly. All right, that will um, that'll bring us in now. With that's that's one game down. Let's look at the second one, which was a replay of a game we saw two days ago, where Brandon Ingram hit the game winner for the Pelicans over the Portland Trailblazers. And in this one, um, very much uh, a different scenario. Portland smacks them, one twenty five, one hundred three. The Pelicans going with the same starting lineup as the last game. We know that there is huge opportunity for Pelicans players with two key members out. Some might say two of their best five players not there. DeJounte and Trey Murphy. So CJ McCollum is taking advantage, and we expected him to. 36 minutes, 26, 4, and 3 with four steals. It is the perfect sell high. You, you in, in Nearly any time you want to do a sell high, you have to understand you are going to sacrifice short term. Like, it is still five weeks away for DeJounte Murray returning, maybe a week and a half to two for Trey. Two weeks, probably. Right, so you will lose... Value on CJ in the short term. The idea is that when it all settles later on, you've made a profit on it. But it just takes time to get there. Eve Misi, probably one of his worst games. 20 minutes, 5 points, but he had 2 steals. He had 2 blocks. He's been really good. The blocks is where it's at. That's what you should be looking at. The other stuff, whatever, it will come and go. The 20 minutes is a little frustrating, and there's still other stuff that can change because Zion's not playing a full load. And there are those two other guys to come back. And I'm not sure that Misi will hold these numbers long-term. But for now, it's there. Jordan Hawkins, like I said, 34 minutes. Now, he only played 28 last game, so this is a big change. And the 17 points is nice. The seven rebounds is good. He doesn't do really anything else, although three assists is not terrible. He shot fine, 
but it is all like predicated on volume and scoring, which is going to be hard to maintain when other players come back. He will just not play 34 minutes. It won't happen. Write it out now. Use it now. Understand that it's a limited skill set, a limited stat set that's probably going to fall away. Ingram was not at his best, 14, 8, and 6. And speaking of not at his best, what's going on with Zion? 28 minutes for Zion and 25% shooting. He somehow hit 80, 80% from the line, 8 of 10. I don't know where that came from. But 14, 3, and 4 with no steals. That's two games with incredibly low field goals. And this is a guy whose best category should be field goal percentage or points. Why is he so... What illness did he have? Why is his minutes so low? No answers, of course, from the Pelicans. But that's very weird. Not a great game from Herb Jones in the first half. In fact, he was Tony Snelling it, but he ended up with 12 points. He got two steals and he shot 71%. That's better. In category leagues, sorry, in points leagues, I don't think that he's a must roster. In category leagues, he is, but we know what it is. It's a low scoring guy who'll be usually pretty okay with percentages and he'll get steals and some out of position blocks. That's what he does. Nothing's really going to change there. And that's okay. As long as you understand what the expectation is, totally, totally cool. The Portland side is where things, well, things are already interesting across many different um, spots. But, you know, look at, look at us go here with old Portland. What's going on with Jeremy Grant? The Ides of March, 29 minutes, 28 points. He had two threes. He hit, he had two steals. He had four blocks. He got to the line 12 times. He didn't hit him. But why is he getting defensive stats all of a sudden? Why is Jeremy Grant a, like, top 20 player over the course of this season so far? He has not shown this in ever, honestly, but definitely not last four or five years. This is screaming that, hey, these are the first three games of the season, so it's a three-game chunk that we really pay attention to, but there is no way that this is going to hold. I, I can't see why that would be the case when we've got reams of evidence, mountains of documents that tell us that Jeremy Grant doesn't do this. But if you picked him late, like you are very happy. Dundra Ayton has been serviceable, 17 and 12, good efficiency, like he's about the right spot where you drafted him. And Anthony Simons had 27, 2, and 6. Solid stuff. Really bad one from Scoot and a really bad one from Denny Avdia. Scoot had 9, 5, and 7 on 17%, which is horrendous, while Avdia was 33% shooting and had 11, 6, and 3. And like Herb Jones, he was like scoreless in the first half. Denny is sort of like, I think he's struggling a little bit to figure out where to fit in. And that was part of my concern with him in Portland is like, there are a lot of guys who need the ball and one of them is Shaden Sharp and he's not even there. So what does Denny do? Because his big breakout stuff came in Washington when guys were out and he was the number two player. And he's never going to be that with this iteration of the team. So still hold it, but understand that some of these struggles are not unforeseeable. Tamani Kamara was solid. As for Scoot, sorry, I think that you do hold him, but I get it. Like That's that's not a good showing. That's def- look, He's still been useful enough, but that was not good. Donovan Klingon played only 13 minutes. But he had 9-9 nine and nine with two blocks, which is an outrageous level of production in 13 minutes. I think he had 6-6 six and six with two blocks in like six minutes, so it did cool off. Now, Klingon has been pretty solid. But I won't sit here and tell you that he's going to be an absolute 100% must roster player. It is so hard for a 14-15 minute a night player to be that for 10 and 12 team leagues, especially in a points league. Like, he's averaging under 19 fantasy points. That's really good, 9-9. Nine nine. Two blocks is great. We stream him in for big man numbers. He's rostered in a lot of leagues already, um, but I do think he's going to have a big opportunity at the end of the season, but he's just not playing. He's not playing enough at now for me to go, yeah, we're always going to get good numbers. But you know what? This is a good game. Tamani Kamara was also really strong to me. I think he's more of a 14-team league player. Kamara went 12-3-4 and four with two steals. Probably his best outing, I would say. He's sort of on the fringes of 12s. If you want him, fine. If he fits your build, no worries. In a points league, we probably don't worry too much, although he's averaging 24 fantasy points. He's like a borderline-ish sort of a player who's who's shown some some moments, and, and that's it. And also, by the way, there was a lot of chatter in the offseason about what Delano Banton was going to do. This man is not even in the rotation. He was a massive silly season legend last season, but he, he's one of those guys where it was, honestly, just yeah, very clearly uh, silly season, allowing those numbers to be put up. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Game Time app. Game Time is always innovating, always bringing new things out. And the new thing they've got is the new feature Game Time Picks, which makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play even easier. Filtering through the fluff, finding the incredible deals, in addition to all the other things they already do. The flash deals, the zone deals, the views from your seat, the event 
cancellation protection, the job loss protection, the lowest price guarantee. It is all there. Get a panoramic view from your seat in the app to see what you're going to see when you get to the arena slash stadium slash whatever. Game time gets all that. And game time picks help save you time and money. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time picks. Download the game time app, create an account, and use the code locked on NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create the account, redeem the code L O C K E D O N N B A for $20 off. Download game time today. What time is it? Game time. Okay. That is two games done. Let's go on to the uh, the third game of the day. We're talking Dr. Rivers, Glenn Rivers at it again. An apple a day really does keep the doctor away. The Nets beat the Bucks 115-102, so Milwaukee is now 1-2 and two on the season, despite or well, their only win is against Philadelphia. So, you know, they're, um, they're cooking. Uh, Glenn Rivers is just dominating. He's just a, a huge legend, and you know, you know what he's doing. Um, yeah, they, they stink. I worry a little bit about Giannis playing tomorrow, honestly, on a back-to-back. He's been listed probable so far in their games. He was fine here, yeah? 22-12-7, and seven, and actually didn't even destroy your field goals and had a steal and a block, so you know, good, oh, free throw, so really good. Dame, not so much. Like, he was fine. 21-4, four assists, 39%. Dame's been you know, about where he was drafted, that early third, late second round type of area. We're getting a lot more Bobby Portis than I thought. And I think a lot of that is Chris Middleton's absence because it means Torian Prince plays exclusively at the three. So Portis had 16 and 10 in 27 minutes. This is what he does. He double doubles. He's had nice field goal percentage. But long term, I don't really see it. I don't think he plays 27 a night. While Brooke Lopez, this is where we talk, one of the best illustrations I've ever seen in terms of game to game variance, the low volume stats and how they kill you at times. Brooke Lopez had six blocks in game one. He had three blocks in game two. That's nine blocks, averaging four and a half. So, of course, in this game, he has zero. Zero. It's like, imagine like Luca, 33 points a game scorer, comes out and has four. These categories, now, again, that's an extreme example, even with the blocks. But it happened. It does happen. Often. That's why they can become a really frustrating category to always rely on. Gary Trent remains really bad, but if you added him for the back-to-back stream, we've got one half of that back-to-back to go. Trenner had nine points with two threes, and let's, again, I think we can all say in unison that he sucks. There will be people who tell you that he's good. They're wrong. There'll be people that tell you he's an awesome fantasy asset. They're also wrong. But he's a good stream guy as a 12-team league player just for this back-to-back, and then you move on. Get that garbage out of here. And the artist formerly known as Torian Prince, one of the most added players. He played 34 minutes. They're so off to a good start, I guess. Oh, no, three points on four shots. We also know what this guy does. Darvin Ham's son really struggled again. He had seven rebounds. The minutes are fine. He's a stream option, which don't always play out, but he's a stream option until Middleton returns. Then he'll pull back, and then we'll get nothing out of him. Again, as you should have expected. That is who Torian Prince is. That is who he has always been, basically. And that's where we go. How about your Brooklyn Nets, though? 115-102 over the Bucks, And this one... I've been very wrong on. I did not think that they would be pumping usage in minutes into Dennis Schroeder. Didn't think it would happen at all. 35 minutes for Schroeder, 29, 4, and 6 with five threes. He shot the ball really well. He's been awesome. I did not see it coming. Yeah, he has to be rostered. I I just, I didn't think that they would do it, and they did. So there you go. Cam Thomas has been basically as expected. He's a top 20 player so far in both categories and points. He yeah, got 32 points with two steals and two threes and played 35 minutes. He took a million free throws. He took a million field goals. It's him and Schroeder doing everything at the moment. They combined for 36 shot attempts out of the team's, what, 91? 91. Yeah, 36 out of 91 for two players. Best game for Claxton so far as he works his way back, 22 minutes, 10 and 11 with two blocks. That's, yeah, if he got 10 and 11 in two blocks in 30 minutes, you'd say, well, that's awesome. But he got it in 21, so we're, we're good there. Well, Cam Johnson was also better. 13 and 6, three threes, two steals. Ben Simmons only played 24 minutes. He had two points. He had six rebounds, six assists. We wanted to see what they would do with Simmons. We wanted to see where the value would be. We wanted to see if he'd stay healthy. We took him in a late pick to see what would go on. It's like, I think that you move on, honestly. If you're desperate for assists, sure. But they're not pushing him into any big minutes. And I think we can say the same for Noah Clowney, who I still really like. But what we wanted to do, and that's what we do with those late flies, we don't know how they're going to run things. 
And we want to see what his role is, but 21 minutes isn't enough. He had 13 and 4, which that's one of his better ones with three threes, but shot poorly, no defense. And a 21 minute a night second year player is just not a useful um, guy to be holding on to. Again, always changes if you've got deeper benches, stash ability, games cap, that sort of stuff. But for regular rosters, no. Dorian Finney-Smith was also a usable stream today, but like, yeah, three points in 25 minutes with two steals. Again, because he is not good. We just tried to look at patterns of minutes and usage and not even usage. Like, what's his role? Like, he's starting. He's playing 30 minutes and he just didn't. And he just didn't do anything. And he didn't even block a shot because they are a notoriously tough category to try and peg down. Jalen Wilson played 32 minutes in the opener and has not combined for 32 in the next two games. He had two points in 14 minutes. Yep, I... Don't really know what happened, but we don't need to roster him in 10 or 12 or 14 team leagues. And there'll be a period down the stretch of this season where Jalen Wilson and Noah Clowney are putting together big numbers. But that period is not now, I think pretty obviously. Let's go to the next game. It was another pretty big blowout, but this time by the team that's actually good. And that is the Oklahoma City Thunder over the Atlanta Hawks. 128-104, the final score. The Hawks made a change to their lineup with DeAndre Hunter out. It was time for Zachary Rissachet to make his first career NBA start. And that's where we'll start off looking at it. He played 27 minutes. He had 13 and 6 with a steal and a block, which is totally reasonable. That's a pretty good line in that role. The problem is, is does he hold that role? Because there's no Hunter. There was no Bogdanovich. Like, if both of those guys play, does he go back to 22 minutes? Is this all we needed? Is just one opportunity for the number one pick to start, and now he holds onto the role? Again, that's the decision we don't know. We don't know what Quinn Snyder is going to do. Do we take that flyer and think of Rissa as a must-grab player? Like, I don't know. I'm not sure his upside is super sky-high that we need to 100% take that risk, but I'm not going to talk you out of doing it. Like, it's okay to do. Trey Young had 24-1-8, which is obviously not as good as his other games, but still really good. Well, it was Garrison Matthews who really stepped up here. 14 points with four threes and two steals, but we can just ignore most of that. Can we ignore Clint Capella? I guess, like 22 minutes, 10 rebounds is good. Six points and a steal and a block is fine, but a Kongwu played more minutes, but definitely not as good as the other games. And it's after that first game, it has dropped off. Now, I'm not going to complain about 14 and three with a with a three and a steal, but you do want more than that. We are still obviously holding a Kongwu, and we are adding him if he was dropped. Capella probably should still be a, a hold there. Um, but yeah, we just had a, a Hawks team who'd put up good numbers going up against an unbelievably good team. That meant Dyson Daniels also struggled. Seven points in 34 minutes on 27%. But I actually don't mind. Eight rebounds, two assists, one steal, one block. You, I don't think you could ask for much more than that in a game where he struggled. And how about my man, David Roddy? 20 minutes for David Roddy Piper. He had 10, 5, and 3. Ty Stones, Super Soldier Serum. Um, cool. Don't care. Don't think he's going to play most nights. Even though like that was solid, don't think we need to worry. Do we need to worry about Jalen Johnson, though? Because he sucks at the moment. 29 minutes for Johnson. Seven points. 29 minutes, 7 points. I'll let that sink in. It was a a poor night. He had foul trouble as well. We talked, or I talked a lot, and you may or may not have listened about Jalen Johnson saying that I think he's going to have a big usage increase, but we need to be cautious because his percentage numbers and all of his impact stats all tailed off dramatically at the end of last season. And that has like showcased itself big time. I don't think you need to panic that much, though. He played 29 minutes despite five fouls. He had nine rebounds. He had a block. He took 13 shots. Only 23% of those went in. But there is no way that, again, if we're seeing someone's field goal percentage start with a two, it's just not a realistic thing to continue. It's not going to continue. He might not reach the heights of his first 30 games of last season in terms of shooting numbers. Reasonable. I don't think we expected that. But this level of production, where he's been stinking, well, we can go in there and we can understand that there is going to be a huge, huge change in the positive direction for Jalen Johnson. I think it's a very clear buy low because there's going to be people who struggle and they're going to look at it and they're going to look at it and go, man, this guy's terrible. What are we doing? Why do I take him? No, that's where you come in. Now, a buy low is not sending a top 30 player. It's not sending a top 50 player. A buy low on Jalen Johnson is sending a top 80. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If it does, it does. You can only judge that in your league. There is, I don't see any real point in a trade of like, well, I'll see, if I send my top 50 player for Jalen Johnson, who I think is top 50 also, uh, who cares? Like, there's no point in that. Like, 
apologies to this man here that, that tweeted me this, but I like to use real life examples of people who are either learning the game or doing stuff in fantasy that's important to know. Well, he's like a man, Halliburton's really struggling. Should I do a buy low and send James Harden? No. No, you don't, because that's not a buy low. James Harden has a, if you can make, this is the general rule of thumb on a trade. If you can make an argument that the player that you're trading away for the buy low, an easy argument for why they would finish equal or ahead of them, you don't do it. You just don't. If I could trade Bobby Portis to get Jalen Johnson, I would do it because I can't come up with a cogent argument to suggest that Portis will be better than Jalen this season. But if it means that I'm trading like Jarrett Allen or it means that I'm trading, let me think of a name, Zion, Branding, maybe not, probably not Branding, but like one of those guys, like, yeah, I don't know about that. Then I don't do it. The idea of a buy low is not to just get the player. It's to get the player for value. And if you can't get it, don't worry about it. It's okay. It really is. And that's how I think you should be approached. And if you've got Jalen Johnson, for God's sake, don't sell low on him. There are always very clear indicators of things that are going to improve here. Larry Nance, another DMP said So that's a little weird, the way that they're using him at the moment. But it is, as some would say, what it is. Let's go to the other side of the equation. It is your Oklahoma City Thunder. Um, They're just good, man. They made another starting lineup change. They're third so far of the season. And none of them have included Alex Caruso in the starting lineup. First, it was Isaiah Joe. Then it was Kaysen Wallace. And now is Aaron Wigo Wiggins. They win at 128-104, and Shea was awesome. 35, 11, and 9. Three steals, three blocks, and 10 of 9 from the line. He is absolutely cooking. Like, three steals and three blocks is obviously comically good. It's comically good. He will not continue that pace. That Of, of that, I am 100% certain it is just not going to happen. He is now averaging 3.3 steals and two blocks per game. He's hitting 2.33s. He's the number one player in fantasy. He's a little bit under where he, you want him for his field goals at 45%, and his free throws are at 90 so they're all good. It's just those defensive stats are flying, and they will not do that. Like, he just cannot happen. But it's been great, and you enjoy it. Chesterfield Holmgren, six blocks, 25 points, nine rebounds, three threes. If, if we knew Hartenstein was out, we would definitely have looked at him as the early second-round player. And when that move came that Hartenstein was going to be out, then it does help Chet. Obviously, he is cooking at the moment. And the Bronco was also great, Jalen Williams. Now, unfortunately, just four of eight from the line. But 29 with two steals is really good. He has gone back, though, to not taking threes. He's also not making them now either. Not, uh, zero for three. What about Alex Caruso? That's going to be the big question mark because he played 21 minutes again. Now, if you drafted Alex Caruso in a points league, that was probably a mistake to begin with. And I think you move on there. No, no questions asked. If you drafted Alex Crusoe in a category league, you drafted him to get defensive stats. And he got three steals and two blocks. Again, can't complain about that at all. But it's really, really hard to produce enough in those categories. Like You're talking with T. Stiebel here. Like, is that the player that you want? Crusoe averaged two points. Well, not yet, yeah, not average. He got two, two, and one. Like, that stinks. But then three steals and two blocks. At the moment, that gives him a bit of a buffer to hold. But I'm not sure that I would. Long term, I, it's moving towards if he's playing 21 a night, that is a, a really challenging hold. Kaysen Wallace had another three steals. This Thunder team got 13 steals and 12 blocks today. Compare and contrast to the Hawks who had seven and four. And Aaron Wiggins had nine points in 18 minutes. So it's the Wallace, Caruso, Wiggins, Joe combination. There's just It eliminates all of the value. And then we're going to have another big readjustment when Hartenstein eventually returns because, you know, these rotations, they won't hold. They, they can't stay the same when those players, when Hartenstein returns. It just doesn't happen. So they're cooking. They're an unbelievably good team. There's going to be frustrations with Caruso, who is on the borderline. And there's going to be some players who are, are on your wire who are definitely worth grabbing and dropping Caruso. Because it is just so hard to do this in 21 minutes a night. And that is very clearly at the moment the way that Mark Dagnott is going to handle this rotation. It could change at any point. The lineup has changed every game. But the minutes have been relatively consistent for Caruso. So we just have to be aware of it. We have to be aware of that low playing time and the ceiling it puts on production. Let's go to the final game of the day. The Clippers go on to take on the undefeated Golden State Warriors who are no longer undefeated. 
One, uh, what is it? 109, 104, the final score. The Clippers get the victory. Actually, 109 is not correct. 112, 104 is the final score here as the Clippers get the win. Of course, they're still without old mate Kawhi Leonard, but they ran the same starting lineup that they ran last time out. Um, the big story here is, of course, if it's Zubats, it has to be. That was pretty bullish on grabbing Zubats this season. I didn't expect him to be a top 20 player, but he currently is. We talked a lot about how Ty Lue, I believe, had mismanaged his minutes and not played him enough. And I thought, yeah, this should be the year that he gets to 30. There's not enough perimeter defenders to play the small ball stuff. Well, he's playing 38 a night. 23, 17, and 6. Two steals at a block. 53 from the field. 75 from the line. It's amazing stuff. Actually, as much as it is a sell high, it's not. Like, no one's going to give you top 20. No one's going to give you top 50. But there is an outside shot. He is a top 50 player. So you just enjoy it if you grabbed him. I can't even remember in my drafts whether I did. I know that I talked him up a lot. I hope that I did. And I'm just checking this while we're talking. um, Because it would be annoying if I didn't. Let's see. Uh, I've got him in one one league only. Bloody hell. That's annoying. Anyway, that's okay. Got him. Jimmy Harden, 23, 7, and 11. Poor shooting, but you love the 9 of 9 from the line. He's been basically what we thought, and that's awesome. While Chris Dunn played 28 minutes out of nowhere here, only had the 6 points, but 9 rebounds, 4 assists, and 4 steals. He was unbelievable defensively. And that, that sort of performance just completely puts the pin in anything you might have for Kevin Porter. Like, just get rid of him. 7 points. Two steals for Porter. Jerk him off. No, sorry, jack him off. That's the right word, isn't it? Get that garbage out of here. Um, Storm and Norman Powell, not his best game. And this is a very Norman Powell game. 20 points, one rebound, zero assists. He did have foul trouble, so the playing time was down. But while everyone is... Well, everyone. While Kawhi Leonard, who's literally the only player out, while Kawhi Leonard is out, Powell is going to get a lot of shots. And he's going to continue to start. And it's very clear that he is a better player than Terrence Mann, who had two points in 18 minutes. Derek Jones also, second consecutive solid game. 18 points, three threes for Jonesy, two steals, 70% shooting. I'm not a big Derek Jones guy for fantasy, but the results are there. If I'm in a 14-team league, I'd add. 12, I would debate, but it's it's there. At the moment, it is there. Kai Jones played five minutes. For the Warriors, the big news out of this one, of course, is Steph Curry, who sprained his ankle, came back in, Sprained it again, and then left and did not return. He looked to be in significant pain. He had 18, 4, and 6 with two steals before that, but that really doesn't matter. Um, At the moment, I'm just going to expect that Steph is out for next week, for week two, but I don't know. Now, this is the thing when you play a 12-man rotation, that when someone like Steph goes out, nobody jumps into the rotation, just all of Steph's minutes and usage get distributed. And the only guys who can even masquerade as being point guards are D'Anthony Melton, and Brandon Pajemski. And even that, they're not point guards. Draymond Green is going to have to be the point guard. Speaking of, well, I haven't spoken about it yet, but we should um, we should speak about it in a sec. We should speak about Wash Watch, as I remember, to turn the Warriors' game score across. Because um, Draymond is not playing well. We'll talk about Draymond actually right now, because he had two points, five rebounds, and two assists. It's been a terrible start. I would not drop Draymond, but it is not looking great. So, Melton didn't do much here. Eight, one, and zero. I don't mind a grab of Melton if you wanted to, if we think Steph's going to be out and maybe you want to hear for more information, but the preemptive ad is okay because the two guys that I think are probably going to take on the ball handling role both sucked here. Pajemski had four, five, and four on 25% shooting, and this man is just struggling in a massive, massive way. Massive way. Um, But I think they're both worth considering. The other one is Buddy Heald, whose minutes were way up. Now, You'll be shocked to know that Buddy Hill did not shoot 75% from three, and he had eight points despite playing 28 minutes when he'd played, what, 14 minutes in the other game and had 23 points? Because that stuff was not sustainable. But this is this is way more interesting because he played 28 minutes. He had a triple one. He shot 21%, again, showing you the vagaries of shooting percentages. But with Steph out, there were just those minutes, like there's those 30, 31 minutes or whatever it was that Steph was getting. There's Steph's 30-plus usage, and there's Steph's ball handling. That has to go somewhere. Now, it still could get mixed and matched, but that's one, that's the biggest piece out of that puzzle, as much as we love Steph and we want him there, but it should help to give a bit more clarity. Like Andrew Wiggins stepped up here. He had 29 points with five threes. We make sure he's on a roster. John Kaminga might do more now. I wouldn't, wouldn't say he was good here, but he was better. He played 22 minutes and had 12 and five with three steals. Like this is what we hold for. Bad percentages, but everyone's going to have to do a little bit more. It was also a pretty big game from Kavon Looney who had 10 and 11. 
He had three steals, and he relegated Chase Jackson Davis to a small role. I'd be inclined to hold Jackson Davis, but 4-1-1, one, one, obviously, he's not going to cut it. And it's just going to be a lot of back and forward with this whole team, it feels like, all season. But there is a huge opportunity for somebody. Melton, Heald, Pajemski, Wiggins, Kaminga. All of them are going to get some sort of boost. The ball handling is not really going to go to Wiggins or Kaminga, I'm guessing. It's not really going to go to Heald. It's going to go to Melton and Pajemski and Draymond. So they could get that bump up because you need somebody who can run one pick and roll, maybe. But it's also part of the problem of going into a season with like one point guard on the roster and it's Steph Curry. That's it. There's, there's no one else who's realistically a point guard on this team. So, yeah, after the Warriors smashed their first two opponents, things turned dire uh, very, very quickly here. Very quickly. Let's, let's do the monstrous line of the night. Who do you think it was? Well, I'll tell you, I'll give you a little hint. It um, it was a player for the Oklahoma City Thunder, and it was Shea Goodis alexander who had 35, 11, and 9 with three steals and three blocks. Honestly, that will end up as one of the better lines for the entire season. It's a ridiculously good line. He's a ridiculously good player. The steal and blocks will come down, but that's just awesome, awesome stuff. Your waiver wire line of the night, the best player that is available According to our metric, in over 50% of leagues, actually 55% of leagues, is the uh, cutoff I'm using at the moment. We're going to go to that final game of the day, and we're going to go to Chris Dunn. He only had six points, but nine rebounds, four assists, and four steals. So when we're talking desperation, steals, and assists streaming, Dunny has to be at least in the discussion because he was awesome for this team. The young gun of the night, should we work our way back across the Midwest, back to Oklahoma City? Because this man, despite your protestations that maybe he's not a second-year player, he is. He was a rookie last season, and Chet Holmgren is your young gun of the night. Chet had 25-9. and He blocked six shots. It's been a ridiculous start to the season for Chet. We'll see how much Hartenstein impacts him, but that is so far away that Chet has really stepped it up, and he's been great so far this season. And lastly, we look at the dud of the night. Who is the worst highly rostered performer across the NBA. Well, that player also played in that final game, and it is Trace Jackson Davis, who was rostered in a lot of spots. He had 4-1-1. Again, I would probably hold just to see what happens and the Warriors rotations. We still don't know. Like, this game gave us a little bit more clarity, but then Steph left. And Jackson Davis played poorly. We got 20 minutes out of Looney, who looked like he couldn't even move at all last season. So there's obviously some stuff we still need to figure out there. Let's... um. Let's take a look at the top six players across category leagues and waiver wires and points leagues and all of that sort of stuff. That's where we're at at the moment. The top six category league players for the day, it is Shea, followed by Chet Holmgren, Ivan Zubats, Tyrese Maxey, Dennis Schroeder, and Anthony Simons. Your top six players that are available in over 55% of leagues, Chris Dunn and Derek Jones. It, I, I don't. I think I would add Jones over Dunn in twelve team leagues because there's more minute stability. Kevon Looney and Garrison Matthews. I'd throw those in the bin. Lou Dort. I'm surprised that Lou Dort is still so lowly rostered considering the three games in four nights the Thunder had. Now he played really well today, and he's not a twelve team must at all. But it really worked out well. And then Tamani Kamara is the next one who is pushing a claim to be at very least a fourteen team league player. Maybe pushing up a little bit higher after that. The top six Yahoo Points League players for the day are actually, I believe, close enough to the top six players for ESPN, but we'll show you both. It's Shea at one, followed by Chet, Tyrese Maxi, Ivica Zubats, Jeremy Grant, and then Yanni Antetokounmpo. And then your top six ESPN Points League players are Shea, it's Chet, it's Maxi, it's Zubats, it's Jeremy Defensive Player of the Year legend Grant, and Dennis Schroeder. We should go in now and, um, and check out how I did in my leagues. I haven't ever looked myself. Hopefully, it's not terrible. It probably is. Let's have a look. All right, so we'll start with industry pickup. You saw the auction draft live there. Now, to be completely fair to me, which maybe you don't care whether it's fair or not, I've got DeJounte Murray on this team. So, yeah, that's not a great start to the season, having DeJounte Murray here, and I got cooked by Joel Bartolotta uh, from Rotowire. 7-2, he beat me. He had a games played advantage, which is one of the things that in this league is usually not going to be a problem. But without the games on Monday, I was four games lower, and I was trying not to completely stream through just to you know, hold on and see what we could get. Um, but I only had 35 games. He had 39. He beat me 7-2, and I had DeJounte Murray. So yeah, 
Not a great start there in industry pickup. The second auction uh, draft that I showed on the channel is this one here. It's called the Immaculate Pivot, the name of the draft. And I beat Jared Johnson in that one five to four. So happy with that because I had... You know, I'm happy to win that because I had Jalen Johnson and Zion Williamson in that team. But Tyrese Maxey, Cam Thomas put up some big numbers. So I'm happy to get the victory in that one. Um, what's the next league we should take a look at? Let's look at the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Bowl Draft and Stash, which was a, a long-term rotisserie league. Um, where am I in the standings for that one? This one will take a little bit of time. We'll have a look. I'm in the Aquamarine division. And I'm second after week one there. And if I have a look at the total um, the total standings, where am I there? Because there is, I think, 190 teams in this. Oh, 17th out of 190. That's a good start. I'm happy with that. Let's look at the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Bowl, the Roto Division, the Green Division. Now, I can't remember which um, which league am I in in the Green. Let's have a look. Double check. This is riveting stuff for you guys. Let me check the standings for the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Bowl Roto, which again is a long-term um, league. Well, I think I'm in... What league am I in in this? I'm going to pause this because I can't actually remember which league I'm in. Let me go find out so you don't have to sit through it. All right, I am in Pine. I, th I thought I might have been in Pine. I'm currently sixth in that Roto League at the moment. Again, early stages, not a bad start there. Um, we'll go on to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Bowl 9-cat league, which is one that I we drafted early, and I took Kawhi Leonard in, and that was not good at all. 1-8 down in week one in that matchup, and 7-2 in the other. Just a terrible start. Who else did I have in that league? Jesus Christ. Uh, Herbert Jones, Scoot Henderson, yeah. Halliburton, oh my God, that's a, that's a terrible start. For that team, my Locked On Fantasy Basketball Bowl Points League Yellow Division, we ooh, narrowly lost that matchup and lost the other one as well. Who was in that team? Scoot Dort, um, Jalen Johnson, Zion Williams. Yeah, like some bad, bad options there. Uh, Noah Clowney, not a great start at all with that with those ones. So yeah, obviously some work to do across the leagues. I'll go back to industry pickup though and show you the overall scores of everyone, which I didn't mention. Uh, Kingy beat Angle Fantasy Basketball 5-4. Uh, Kyle McEwen lost to Jake from Fantasy Trash Talk 6-3. Josh and Evan from Point Made beat Alec Burns, Alex Burns 6-3. Sam and Liam from Point Made lost to Mitch Casey 5-4. And Karen Talwa beat Willie from Establish the Run 5-4. So everyone else is pretty even, apart from me who got absolutely cooked. In week one, back to the old drawing board. And that brings us back to the end of the show. So what you can do, you could go ahead and give us the old thumbs up here. Subscribe. Let us know how things are going with your team. Tell us, did you win? Did you lose? How do you feel now about Steph's injury? Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.